Hello, ELA scholars. We're back um, with chapter seven of A Mighty Long Way. But before we dig into this chapter, let's go over chapter seven homework questions. Chapter seven will be taking place, um, reading pages 124 through 140. You're always noting details that are happening within each chapter so that you can provide a gist statement. You want to tell me what is the chapter mostly about? What is the central idea of the main idea of the chapter? And finally, just one question from chapter seven. Why was the fact that Washington, D.C. being so segregated was so shocking to Carlotta? She visits Washington, D.C., and she sees things that are a bit um, shocking to her. So let's go ahead into chapter seven. Here we go. Follow along, guys. Chapter seven of A Mighty Long Way, star-studded summer. When the segregationists failed to force the remaining eight of us out of Central with their telephone threats, sidewalk taunts, and courtroom battles, they began targeting our parents. And they hit where it hurt, our parents' pockets and pocketbooks. I first noticed that something strange was going on when my father with my father when he began arriving home from work in the middle of the day on a regular basis. More and more often when I made it home from school, daddy was already there. Before, he had rarely made it home before supper. During the spring of 1958, daddy landed a job as a subcontractor on a new grocery store chain opening in Little Rock. He was hopeful because this was a major construction job expected to last for months. That meant steady work and steady income. For his first day on the job, he left home around sunrise as usual. But when I returned from school that day, he was already home. He and mother were deep in conversation in their bedroom. They laid me off, I heard him say. It happened again. Daddy would get a job and then a few hours or a few days later, he would be told for no apparent reason that his services were no longer needed. Daddy was a meticulous brick mason who had never had trouble finding or keeping work until now. I knew this had to be part of the segregationist scheme to punish him and anyone else involved in the integration of Central. They had already targeted the Arkansas Gazette in a well-publicized campaign to hurt the newspaper's profits. The Gazette had featured editorials that supported integration with the argument that it was the law of the land. The newspaper's coverage of the events at Central seemed more balanced than that of its local competitor, the Arkansas Democrat, which favored segregation. But to the segregationists, there was no middle ground and no such thing as neutral. The Gazette was the enemy. Just months earlier, during the Christmas season, unnamed organizers had announced a boycott against businesses that advertised in the paper. The intention of the campaign was clear, to impact the newspaper's bottom line by taking away its primary source of revenue, advertising dollars. When the Gazette got wind of the boycott, it published on its front page this unsigned letter that had been circulating throughout the community in the days before Christmas. Plans are in the making for a massive crusade to be launched against stores whose ads appear in the Arkansas Gazette. The Gazette has played a leading role in breaking down our segregation laws, destroying time-honored traditions that have made up our Southern way of life, and at last bringing upon the people of Little Rock the most insufferable outrage ever visited upon an American city. The people thus outraged have awakened. They have discovered that this infamous Gazette has a source of revenue. They have further discovered that your store contributions to the Gazette source of income was frequent ads. A crusade using not one approach, but many, lasting not one day or month, but many days and many months, is to be launched not only against the Gazette, but against your store, as long as it advertises in the Arkansas Gazette. Each ad you place in the Arkansas Gazette is to be a positive notification to every outraged white person that your store ignores their feelings and does not care for their business. 
as N words try to push their way deeper into white schools and white society, race relations will continue to be inflamed. This will prove a perfect atmosphere to carry on this crusade. There is a rising tide of race feeling. In fact, a revolution is beginning in the South and in Little Rock. Your store and all stores that advertise in the Arkansas Gazette will be placed on one side or the other. This is your notice to make your own choice. Sincerely, an indignant group. The newspaper also had run a front page rebuttal, calling the letter a vicious and deliberate distortion of the paper's position. While the newspaper was the immediate target, editors wrote, it was not the only one. I now knew that firsthand. I'd heard talk among my comrades that some of their parents had lost their jobs too. Jefferson's father was laid off from his longtime job at International Harvester, which manufactured agricultural machinery, construction equipment, and other products. I often saw Mr. Thomas at the base's home during the day. Gloria's mother, Mary Ray, also was having trouble at work and eventually would be forced out of her job. So was Elizabeth's mother. They all suffered quietly, but when Melba's mother, Louis Lois Patillo, was informed that her contract as a seventh grade English teacher at a North Little Rock Junior High School would not be renewed the next year, she bravely decided to go public with her struggle. Mrs. Patillo, a divorcee who was the family's sole bread winner, wrote a statement and called the newspapers. On May 7th, the Gazette ran her story on the front page and it was picked up by media around the world. The resulting publicity ultimately helped Mrs. Patillo get her job back. My father wasn't quite as fortunate. He still could not land a decent contract in Arkansas. My grandfathers helped out as much as they could. Grandpa Cullens mostly took small jobs as the primary contractor on construction projects for black churches, schools, and businesses that allowed him to bypass the races, and he was able to hire daddy to work for him. Big Daddy also gave daddy more work hours in the cafe pool hall, and mother went back to work. Still, my parents were struggling financially. Mother began paying more attention to price tags in the grocery store and buying just the essentials. The occasional splurges on clothing, furnishings, and out-of-town trips also came to a halt. Then one day, my parents told me that daddy would be going to Los Angeles, California for the summer to work. He had heard that plenty of good paying construction jobs were available there. The news was bittersweet. I was happy that daddy, who took such pride in his work, finally would be able to do the kind of work he enjoyed and make the money he deserved. But I would miss him. When daddy was away from his, for even a day, I always felt less secure. Ernie's graduation helped to make helped to take my mind off daddy's departure. I was so proud of my friend. His graduation said to the world that even under the most extreme circumstances, black students could perform as well as any others. Ernie had persevered through a hell that only the nine of us knew, and he completed all but his final walk across the stage. I wanted to be there to support him and was disappointed to learn that we would not be able to attend. Each graduate was given only six tickets for family members. School officials had already banned any non-white journalists from the graduation ceremony for security reasons, and they were not apt to make any special arrangements for the other seven of us Black Central students. As expected, there had been a higher than usual number of threats. In such a volatile atmosphere, anything could happen. On May 27th, a Tuesday evening, about 4,500 parents, guests, and school officials gathered at Quigley Stadium for the big event. Hundreds of National Guard troops were there, and practically every police officer and detective on the Little Rock Force had been called to duty. Some were assigned to keep watch over the homes of Superintendent Blossom and Central's principal, Jess Matthews, who were at graduation and feared their properties could become bomb targets. I gathered my family in the den just before 8 p.m. to listen to a radio broadcast of the ceremony. That familiar knot in my stomach tightened as I listened, hoping that those with hateful intentions wouldn't ruin Ernie's special night. 
Governor Favis and his crew of diehard segregationists already had proclaimed the first year of integration at Central a dismal failure. Who knew if one of those loonies would make it a self-fulfilled prophecy with some final desperate act? Ernie was among 602 graduates to receive their diplomas that night. About 50 minutes into the ceremony, his name was called. It seemed as though all of Little Rock, maybe even the entire nation, was holding its breath. This was the most publicized commencement in history, and all the attention boiled down to this moment. This was not a sound. No laughter, no cheers, no applause none of the celebratory expressions that had accompanied the names of the other graduates, just silence. I exhaled as I imagined Ernie proudly walking across the stage, the first colored student ever to do so. Surely all those ghosts of our history, those unnamed colored warriors who'd risked torture by their white slave owners to learn the words in their Bibles, who braved the woods, the waters, the whips, and the snarling dogs, and died without ever reaching brighter shores. Surely they were helping to lift his head and straighten his shoulders now. The next day, under President Eisenhower's orders, the National Guard was withdrawn. A newspaper newspaper report estimated that the cost of federal protection for the Little Rock Nine that school year had been a whopping $3.4 million. That was a staggering figure in 1958, more than twice the amount it had cost to build Central 30 years earlier. Wow, unbelievable. So Ernie has graduated. Remember guys, he was the oldest of the group of the Little Rock Nine. Okay, make sure you're annotating. Ernie graduates, okay? That's big, that's huge. Here we go. The media also took note of one special guest who had attended the graduation with Ernie's family, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. At the time, Dr. King was clearly on the rise, having achieved a claim as leader of the successful Montgomery bus boycott. He had not yet achieved the legendary status that will come in the years ahead. He was just another man in the crowd. The mention of Dr. King in a newspaper made me flash back to the first time I met him. He had come to Little Rock to speak and was staying at the home of Mr. and Mrs. Bates, who invited the nine of us to meet him. I brought my friend Bunny along and meeting Dr. King remains one of the highlights of her life as it is mine. But I have to chuckle because to this day, my most vivid personal memory of one of the world's most reverent leaders is not of eloquent words or a suit and tie moment. It is of him dressed down, eating barbecue, and drinking beer around a card table in the basement of Mr. and Mrs. Bates' home. Unbelievable, guys. Dr. King. Unbelievable. Dr. King's quiet presence spoke to the national significance of Ernie's graduation. Now for Ernie, Central was history. He was heading to Michigan State University in the fall. For me, Central was history too, at least for a while. Summer had officially arrived and not a moment too soon. Within days of Ernie's graduation, the eight of us took a plane to Chicago to be honored by the Chicago Defender. It was the first plane ride for most of us, including Mother, whom Mrs. Bates had selected as chaperone for the trip. Minnie Jean met us there, and we were all thrilled to see her again, and to no vacation together for several days in this city. We all had read and heard about but had never seen. We stayed downtown in an integrated luxury hotel. Gloria and I roomed together, Minnie and Melba, Elizabeth and Thelma, and the three guys. The newspaper honored the nine of us with the Robert Singstack Abbott Award, named for the founder and editor of the Chicago Defender, who was the most successful black newspaper publisher of his era. He had been an early advocate of the civil rights for Ian Words and had used the pages of his newspaper to encourage colored men and women in the South to move north to pursue a better life. The banquet in honor was held at the Morrison Hotel, a 46-story tower 
that at the same time was the world's tallest hotel and a longtime Chicago landmark. It was raised just seven years earlier. All nine of us were overwhelmed by the grandeur of the place, but even more by the size and enthusiasm of the crowd. More than 500 people gathered in the cameo ballroom to be part of the ceremony. I could hardly believe that so many people in this great city had come there to see us. In Little Rock, we had drawn crowds for sure, but most of them wanted to wring our necks, not hug them. Here, people stood to their feet to applaud us. I saw in their faces a reflection of pride of something far beyond this moment. They called us brave and told us we were heroes and that they had been pulling for us. For the first time, it really hit me, the magnitude, the scope of what the nine of us had done. It wasn't just about each of us having access to the best education available in Little Rock. It was about parting once closed doors for colored children everywhere. It was about the sons, daughters, grandchildren, nieces and nephews of the men and women in the cameo ballroom this night. It was about the crowds of people who would fill such rooms in city after city that summer as we traveled throughout the country to meet our supporters and pick up awards. John Singstack, editor of the Chicago Defender and nephew of the newspaper's founder, invited us to his home, a mansion on the south side of Chicago. I had never met colored folks who lived like this. Now that's amazing too, guys. For Carlotta to say she never met colored folks that lived like uh, Robert Singstack. That's very... Um, unreal surreal here but Carlotta is experiencing it firsthand okay so she's at his house his mansion I'm just taking notes annotating my text too I was amazed to see a house full of black servants we were ushered into the basement which included a family room with a theater but as awestruck as I was by Mr. Seen Stack's home, I was equally smitten by his handsome son, who was about my age. The Seen Stacks also invited us to their summer home in Michigan City, Indiana, about an hour from downtown Chicago. There, we were again entertained royally with a host of activities far beyond our realm of experiences, including a boat ride on the family's private lake. In those few days, the nine of us shared more laughter and fun than we had the entire year at Central. We felt like teenagers again, carefree and silly, not nine symbols to be either admired or loathed. Little did we know this was just the first stop in what would be a star-studded summer. In July, we took another plane ride, this time to Cleveland. Mrs. Eckford, Elizabeth's mother, chaperoned. The NAACP was awarding us its prestigious Spring Garden Medal, presented for outstanding achievement. The award was named for Joel Elias Ben Garn, a lifelong civil rights advocate, one of the early white leaders and later board chairman of the NAACP. Ben Garn was a professor of comparative literature at Columbia University and one of the founders of the publishing house Harcourt Brace and Company. His desire was to draw attention to the distinguished achievements of the American N-word with an award that would inspire the ambitions of young people in the community. Spiengarn left 20000 in his will to ensure that the award, a gold medal, would continue into perpetuity. Mrs. Bates and the nine of us were the first and still the only group ever to receive it. I still feel extremely humbled to be mentioned among the great politicians, scientists, historians, scholars, athletes, authors, entertainers, civil rights advocates, and Nobel Peace Prize winners who have been recipients. They include many men and women whose lives I had studied at Dunbar, W.E.B. Du Bois, George Washington Carver, James Weldon Johnson, Carter Woodson, Charles Chestnut, Mary McLeod Bethune, Marion Anderson, A. Philip Randolph, Paul Robeson, Thurgood Marshall, Ralph Bunch, and Jackie Robinson.
1957, the year before we received the award, it was presented to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The ceremony was held July 11, 1958 in the banquet hall of a downtown hotel and once again the room was packed. In one photo used by many news organizations from that night, all nine of us are wearing the medals attached to royal blue ribbons trimmed in gold. All of us are smiling broadly except Elizabeth and Ernie, who must have been just tired. The other girls are all wearing solid pastel dresses, mine is plaid. Terry is mugging for the camera, and my face is turned toward him, smiling more at him than the camera. He probably had uttered something witty. I think all of us were just overwhelmed by the attention and unsure how to handle this new spotlight. Sometime after that photo was snapped, Terry and I decided to have a bit of fun with one of the reporters covering the event. I was standing with Terry in the rear of the banquet hall when I saw the reporter making his way toward us. It was too late for me to make a discreet move in the opposite direction, which I usually did when I saw a reporter heading headed my way. So I stood politely next to Terry, a young intellectual, even then, as he answered a question related to the award. When the reporter asked for his name, Terry responded with a straight face, George Washington. Scribbling quickly, the reporter turned to me, in your name, Martha Washington, I replied, continuing Terry's lame joke. Without even a hint of suspicion, the reporter scampered off to his next subject. At first, Terry and I cracked up, but before leaving the room, we thought better of our little joke, especially when we imagined what Mrs. Bates and our parents might say. We tracked down the reporter and gave our real names. That remains one of my funniest memories of Cleveland. That's funny, guys. Before leaving the city, the nine of us were treated to dinner at the legendary Deering's restaurant known for its original golden brown fried chicken. The popular eatery had an array of food that reminded me of home. Ribs, shrimp, homemade rolls and pastries. It was comfort food, but this was a well-appointed Black-owned restaurant, complete with white linen tablecloths that also drew white residents of the city. Like the events that took place the summer I was eight years old, these experiences opened the gates to a life far more progressive and sophisticated than anything I had ever experienced in Little Rock. Soon after returning to Little Rock, the nine of us were off again with Mrs. Bates to New York for a whirlwind week sponsored and hosted by the AFL-CIO Hotel Employees Union Number 6. Our host, James Marley, and his assistant, Betty Bentz, escorted us around the city, delivering us where we needed to be and making sure we were suitably dressed and on time for our appointments. We were even accompanied by the union's photographer, Mildred Grossman, a tiny lady who didn't seem at all weighed down by the ton of photo equipment she lugged around. She seemed different from the other professional photographers we had encountered. She tried not to be intrusive, though she snapped photos at every turn. In later years, I learned her history. I would understand why she seemed so empathetic towards us. She knew what it was like to be singled out unjustly. She had been among 33 New York school teachers fired from their jobs for refusing to sign a loyalty oath. Disavowing membership in the Communist Party during the McCarthy era. She became a union photographer and traveled the country, capturing some exclusive inside shots of their workers, their campaigns, and their leaders, networking with some of the nation's most renowned political and social figures. She ultimately won a lawsuit against the New York school system and was ordered reinstated to her teaching position. She returned for one day and retired. I had no clue when I met her that summer just how brave and honorable she was, but she earned my respect with her ability to keep up with the nine giddy, adventurous teenagers. First stop in New York was the office of Royal Roy Wilkins, executive secretary of the NAACP, one of the early civil rights leaders I'd learned about at Dunbar. In his presence, I was starstruck, 15-year-old, watching a storybook figure suddenly acquire flesh and bones. Later, we met New York Mayor Robert F. Wagner Jr. We had lunch with the Secretary General of the United Nations, Dag Hammarskjöld, 
1950 Nobel Peace Prize winner Ralph Bunch. Another day, we had Coke and Cookies with Governor W. Avril Harriman and the Waldorf Astoria, where he lived. We attended a fundraiser at the Abyssinian, Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem, where Adam Clayton Paul Sr. had been the pastor. His son, Adam Jr., then a prominent congressman, was with us there, along with their good marshal. They were a charming pair. When it was time to plead for financial support for the NAACP from the audience, Mr. Marshall joked, Now, folks, let's put in dollars. The sound of change hitting the plates makes these kids nervous. Later the same day, we visited Concord Baptist Church in Brooklyn. During dinner, Melba got a chicken bone stuck in her throat and was unable to talk to the congregation as planned. But honestly, by then, most of us were a bit tired of being paraded around. I remember thinking I would have gladly taken that chicken bone to avoid being called on to talk. One of the most memorable evenings in New York was hosted by doctors Kenneth and Mamie Clark, the psychologist who had taken Minnie Jean when she was expelled from Central. They had a lovely home at Hastings on Hudson, and Broadway stars Ozzy Davis and Ruby D were waiting to meet us there. What a nurturing down-to-earth couple the actors were. They had children our age and related to us very much as protective parents inquiring about our well-being. Later, we went to see David Merrick's new Broadway play, Jamaica, starring Lena Horne and Ricardo Montalban. Montalban. Horne's role as the sassy Savannah will earn her a Tony nomination. Ozzie Davis also starred in the production, and he arranged for us to meet the other actors backstage after the show. I loved Lena Horne. She was warm and engaging, not to mention stunning. I knew little then about her politics, how she had refused to perform for the segregated audiences during World War II, how her friendship with outspoken activist and actor Paul Robeson had left her branded a communist and blacklisted in Hollywood in the 1950s, how she again and again aligned herself with civil rights causes. But the more I learned about Lena Horne in the ensuing years, the more I admired her. After the show that night, I just knew that I felt a connection to her, perhaps because she reminded me so much of my mother. The way Mrs. Horne, I'm sorry, the way Miss Horne carried herself, the way she threw her shawl around her shoulders with the grace of an onstage performance, that sure enough was mother. I could tell that Miss Horn and Mrs. Bates connected too. They were two of a kind, both elegant and ladylike, yet feisty and committed to racial justice. After meeting with the performance, Performers, the nine of us students and our adult chaperones ended the evening at Wendy's Restaurant, home of the world famous Cheesecake in Times Square. Owned by Leo Lindy Linderman and his wife Clara, the restaurant was a popular hangout for Broadway and vaudeville stars. There, like everywhere we went, the staff catered to us as though we were stars too. It astounded me that day. After day, we met internationally renowned entertainers and politicians, yet they treated us as if we were the celebrities. It felt unreal at times for me, a bit uncomfortable. The photographer, Miss Grossman, tried to capture it all. She accompanied us everywhere. On Coney Island, when we got on the roller coaster, roller coaster she hopped onto right in the front seat, and she turned to snap photos of us as our cars raced up and down and around the tracks. It seems that Carlotta is being treated like a celebrity while meeting all of these celebrities. Um, That's pretty good. Please make sure you're annotating the text for details in your gist statement. Moving on. She also caught a picture of me on the ferry, leaning over the deck of the boat at the Statue of Liberty. That shot made the cover of The Voice, the magazine of the local union that sponsored our trip. The symbolism was striking. A 15-year-old member of the Little Rock Nine stretching for a clear view of the Statue of Liberty, the great promise of America's democracy. And then 
our glorious week was done. I didn't head back to Little Rock just yet, though. Gloria and I were going to separate separate summer camps in the New York area. Mrs. Bates had received invitations from several organizations for us to participate in summer camps, and she did her best to match our interests. Thanks to a generous sponsor, I was set to spend a month at Camp Menacing, I, a wooded campsite site in the Shiwanak Mountains near Port Jarvis, New York. The New York City Mission Society ran the camp, which offered youth, mostly from Harlem, the chance to experience the outdoors and nature far away from the concrete city. The Mission Society operated a year-round community center in Harlem. It was to Harlem what was what the Phyllis Wheatley YWCA was to Little Rock, a trusted community institution with an endless roster of fun programs aimed at developing young potential. Camp Menacing was similar to the Y teen sessions I'd attended at Camp Clear Fork in the Achachita Mountains of Arkansas. Awachita Mountains of Arkansas, but on a grander scale. Everything it seemed was larger. The lake, which flowed as far as the eye could see, and the woods, which spanned more than 600 acres. But there had been a kind of sameness at Camp Clear Folk. All the campers were primarily colored teenage girls growing up in and around Little Rock. At Mini Sink, we were a mix of boys and girls, middle class and poor, Hispanic and N words. Our days and evenings were spent doing typical outdoor camp activities, hiking, boating, playing games, competing, cooking, cleaning, and singing around the campfire. We took turns busting our meal tables and swapping pieces of our dialects and culture. My friends used to laugh at how I said water. I guess I subconsciously threw in an extra R as in water. And my new northern buddies just found that hilarious. I, of course, had no idea what was so funny because I've never had much of a southern accent. At least, I never thought so. But I had my share of fun, too, with their dialects from Puerto Rico, the West Indian Islands, and those other worlds within the U.S. borders, Miami and the Bronx. For the first time, I was learning about foods I never tasted, trying out dances I'd never seen, and hearing stories about how other kids lived. Finally, my soul and spirit could rest. The other campers all knew my story, and some were naturally curious, but they didn't pester me with questions about Central. I was just one of them. Program director Gladys V. Thorne, whom we affectionately called Thorny, kept us in line. She was a little dynamo, short, no more than four feet, six inches tall, round, and in constant motion. She wore her hair long black. She wore her long black hair pulled back into a bun, and she was the spitting image of actress Juanita Hall, a black woman who played a Pacific Islander in saying Bali Ha in Rogers and Hammerstein film South Pacific. The movie was out in theaters that year, and Thorne joked about the special treatment and double take she got from moviegoers, certain she was the star. Thorne was fun. She felt comfortable hanging out with us teenagers, but she stressed discipline and commitment and ran a tight ship. I've always liked that in people. After the first two weeks of camp, there was a break of several days before the next session started again. Since I couldn't return to Little Rock, I went home to Harlem with another 15-year-old camper, Paula Kelly, who became a fast friend. Her family lived in a two-bedroom flat in a vibrant Harlem community. We walked the neighborhood, shopped, or rather browsed in neighborhood stores, and sat outside on scorching days to watch children play in the open fire hydrants. Then we returned to Camp Menacing for another two weeks. Paula, who attended Ferrello H. LaGuardia High School of Music and Art and Performing Arts was just the kind of student the Mission Society brought into its fold early. She was versatile and super talented. She could sing, dance, and act. She was the leader of my group when the campers broke up by age at the end of each day and performed a dance routine or skip. 
Paula eventually would earn a master's degree in dance from the Juilliard School and become an Emmy-nominated dancer and actress. I've always been so proud to know her. She has performed and danced alongside some of the best in the business, including the late Sammy Davis Jr., Gregory Hines, and Gene Kelly. But she could light up a stage all by herself, as she did at the Academy Awards in 1969 when she danced a solo to Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, which had been nominated for Best Original Song. One of her many memorable television roles was that of a lesbian confronting homophobia in The Women of Brewster Place, produced in 1989 by Oprah Winfrey. Soon it was time to say goodbye to Paula and my many sync friends. The New York couple who had sponsored my camp scholarship came to meet me at the end of the third week. They watched a final production of a play the campers performed and presented, presented me with a silver lapo pen. I thanked them for their generosity, but at 15, I'm sure I couldn't adequately express what a bomb camp menacing had been for my bruised psyche. I hope they knew. At the end of the second two-week session, the Mission Society sponsored a social for all of the students who had been at camp that summer. I got to see friends who had not returned after the first two weeks. This time, we were not in camp clothes, but dressed up, and we got to display on the dance floor all the new moves we had bragged about and occasionally demonstrated on those sweaty days in the woods. I left Camp Menacing knowing that I had made some lifelong friends. There was just one more stop for me before I returned to Little Rock. My eight Little Rock comrades and I had been invited to Washington, D.C. to attend the Elks Convention. Okay, now she's. this is your homework question. She's in Washington, D.C. here. Okay. Let me see real quick, what page is this? Page 139 visits Washington, D.C. Okay, let's keep going on. So she's going to attend Washington, D.C. for the Elks Convention. The nation's capital reminded me of a southern city. After those wonderful weeks in New York, a city that was a true melting pot, Washington felt more like being back in Little Rock. In the stores, on the streets, in the hotel, we were segregated. People of different races lived separately. This was shocking to me. I hadn't expected it in the nation's capital. We were guests on a local television station's version of American Bandstand and got to meet a singer we all adored. He was quite handsome and charming, but as we were headed back to the hotel in the cab one afternoon, some of us witnessed an odd and somewhat startling sight. Police chasing the frazzled-looking entertainer and another man out of the local park. The summer had seasoned me a bit, so what may have appeared puzzling to the more naive seemed obvious to me then. I felt worldly as I explained quietly to those sitting next to me that it appeared our idol must have gotten caught in some kind of romantic rendezvous. This at a time when no one talked openly about sex, let alone same sex relationships. The next day, the nine of us were scheduled to be in a parade, a long, big one with a specially designed float just for us. We arrived late, missed the departure of the float, and had to drive a short distance to catch up to it. The float featured individual desks with each of our names, and it was so high that we had to be hoisted onto it. The next thing I remember is crowds of people waving to us. We smiled big for cameras and waved back. Melba and Minnie Jean especially loved the parade. I hated it. I felt embarrassed, embarrassed that we were such spectacles, embarrassed that we had arrived late, embarrassed by the large geese of it all. I wasn't ungrateful, though. I knew the Elks melt meant well by honoring us in a big way. At a banquet later that night, the group's leaders, 
even presented each of us with a $1,000 scholarship. It was a truly generous gift that helped to relieve our worries about how we would pay for college, and I was thrilled to get it. But I guess after a month of fun, as just another teenager at camp, I wasn't eager to return to the spotlight associated with Central High School. Our group had been late for the parade because beforehand, we had met with Thurgood Marshall for a photo session, which ran longer than expected. Six of us posed for pictures with him on the steps of the U.S. Supreme Court. In one iconic snapshot, Mrs. Bates is one is on one side of him and I am on the other. My comrades are sitting on descending steps, Gloria, Jeff, and Melba on one side, Minnie and Elizabeth on the other. Of all the stars I met that summer, Mr. Marshall was still my favorite. He was my personal hero and every time I saw him, I just felt honored to be in his presence. The time in Washington marked the end of summer break, which had felt like a little slice of heaven. Now it was time to head back to Little Rock and Central. All the way home, I was filled with dread. I knew what awaited me there. I was returning to hell. Wow, that is the end of chapter seven class.